Here's to the finest crew in Starling. When it comes to my crew, you won't get any argument from me. This is a parody. Paramount owns the song. Welcome to the Greatest Generation. It's a Star Trek podcast by a couple of guys who are just a little bit embarrassed about having a Star Trek podcast. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. How are you doing today, Adam? I'm hopped up on chocolate-covered raisins. <laughs> oh, boy. Not even chocolate-covered espresso beans? No. Just the raisins? <laughs> yeah, raisins are enough. Wow. You heard that story about David Letterman eating a stack of six candy bars before every taping of his show? You remember that? Oh hearing God. that, right? No, I've never heard that before. That was his thing. Like, before he would go out, he would rail chocolate bars. <laughs> That's sort of like... His version of what we do in the green room before a live show with tequila sodas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, only in his case, it gave him uh, actual energy to do a great <laughs> comedy show. <laughs> Instead of taking from the spirits of the two hosts of a Greatest Gen live show. Mm -hmm. Great timing uh, <laughs> for that bit, given mm -hmm. that we're trying to sell some tickets to some live shows. Oh, yeah. But it's true. You know, I, I can't disagree with that assessment. I mean, different things work for different people. For David Letterman, the stack of candy bars. For you and me, the stack of booze bottles. Yeah. Wow. That is staggering. Did, do we know what, was it an assortment of candy bars or was it a bunch of one type of candy bar? As I recall the legend, this is going to disgust you. From what I heard, it was Hershey bars. Whoa. Like oh. plain ass Hershey bars. I was picturing like the format of candy bar that like Milky Way and Snickers fall into, which is the like slightly loggier ones. These are yeah. he's just eating straight chocolate. I think you could put down six Hershey bars pretty easily, not even with teeth. Like, like you can <laughs> gum those things down. They're already pretty soft. That's got to be a bit of a stressor teeth-wise, though, just for being on camera. Like, you definitely don't want to go on camera with a little bit of chocolate between... I mean, he guess, I guess he famously had the gap, so the, the two front teeth are not a concern. As a gap man... Tin man. I imagine you've got some specific experience in this department, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely a long-suffering, you know, I cannot eat popcorn or apples without just just dealing with it for the rest of my day or week, depending. Ben's a gap man. <laughs> like you've seen that I, I am an enthusiastic toothpick user. You really are, but there's no toothpick big enough for what you're working with. No. Yeah, I need, I need like the industrial ones. Hey, does your dentist, I, God, I shouldn't even bring up the specter of your dentist, given your traumatic experience with I them. like my dentist. It's, not, it's my periodontist that I had a bad experience with. Do you use toothpicks instead of floss, and does your dentist approve of your general oral health as a result? And I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> as soon as I started asking that question, I was like, boy, you really sound serious about how much you care about the answer to this. I use both. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Mm. Like toothpick for immediately after the meal, but I do, I do hit myself with the floss when I brush my teeth. I can't get with the toothpicks. I've also uh, taken to mouthwash, and uh, I'm liking that a lot. Can't get with the mouthwash either. Too harsh? I used to swish with the Listerine, yeah. and then like when, when the bottle's done, I didn't think to get another one. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably overkill. I don't know. I did like the feeling, the feeling of pain. You know, like when stuff is so clean, it hurts. Mm -hmm. That's mouthwash in my experience. So Letterman must have had six candy bars and then brushed his teeth. Must have. And that's like chocolate into toothpaste is a real funky flavor combination. I mean, uh, a chocolate mint isn't too far off from one of my favorite ice cream flavors. Yeah, but like if you had a chocolate mint ice cream and then immediately brushed your teeth after, I feel like you'd be like, this sucks. <laughs> Of course. I, I think it sucks every time I have to brush my teeth. <laughs> we haven't come up with the technology that uh, that 
removes the need for this? Come on. It does seem like in 2024 that should be available to us. A, uh, I don't know, like a Roomba, but for your mouth? In 2024, I should stick a mouth guard, like tray style, where my teeth are, and it should be like a fucking car wash. Yeah. Like all the jets, like like the water pick thing, that's one jet. Yeah. Give me a jet for each gap between every tooth. Why aren't we doing this? <laughs> we have inventors out there. Yeah. We got that guy that invented a hook that looks like a, a wrecked dick. Why, why don't we have an inventor in our audience come up with this new uh, hack for not having to take so much time brushing your teeth? I would suggest that we uh, ask inventors who aren't hook erect dick inventors <laughs> to focus on this one. Wasn't that guy also a physician? Like, he might be the perfect inventor for this. He might be. Let's follow up. Okay. Let's also follow up with uh, what the crew of the NX01 Entrepreneur are up to, Adam. It's episode 18 of season one of Enterprise today. We're talking about an episode called Rouge Planet. <laughs> Ben, this is an episode title that awakens the imagination, if it were asleep for the first 17 episodes. Rogue <laughs> Planet sounds like a movie title. It sounds like a science fiction book title. Yeah. And I was like, how is this episode going to live up to its great title? Yeah. I feel like Rogue Planet is an idea that they have to explain at some point in the episode. Were you thinking like this this planet is a renegade or were you thinking this is a planet that's not in the orbit of a star? Like sentient planet? <laughs> or yeah, or like the people of this planet are fighting back against something or, you know, whatever. Well, let's get to those matters as they come up because they do, especially toward the beginning of the episode. And we can talk sure. a little bit about how disappointing those moments might have been. But uh, our cold open is on the bridge with Archer, and he's sitting in a very unnatural way. But looking unnatural is kind of the way you can take a good portrait. Yeah. Take your chin up. Just take the picture. And it's embarrassing because everyone is at their stations during. They didn't clear the bridge for this. Yeah. It's humiliating. He's getting a lot of uh, little comments from the peanut gallery. He didn't do the Brie Belke, uh, grab a wad of TP and blot your oil. <laughs> yeah. That's a great tip from her to me. But this is like a reference image for a painter who's going to then make a painting that will hang in the halls of Starfleet Command. That reminds me, Ben, you and I need to send photos to our uh, poster designer for the second oh, contact shoot. tour. Yeah, we sure do. Let's, huh. uh, let's, let's do that immediately. Yeah. We don't need to record this episode, do we? I think we got to get it in the can. Shit. Okay. What Trip is doing, I think, is familiar to us and anyone who has had to improvise with the locations that are available to them. Uh, when you're shooting an interview in an environment, uh, corporate or otherwise, like you just make do with the with what you've got. And yeah. these places are not made for the type of photography or video production that you're trying to do there. The number of conference rooms I've tried to make look like anything at all. <laughs> I mean, you would think at Giant Airplane Company, it would be easy to set up a shot that is dynamic with a lot of depth, with a lot of neat stuff in the background or whatever. Yeah. But the plain truth is... <laughs> mm. I didn't mean for that to be a pun. <laughs> There are very few places of a production environment that are safe or or not too loud or whatever to do the sort of stand-up interview that, that I had to do a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with that phenomenon. Um, so they're talking about this, this portrait and how important it's going to be. Every recruit walking into Starfleet Command is going to see this on the wall. It's a real honor, sir. Archer, very uncomfortable with it. Also, we learn at this conversation that some Vulcans get mummified if they are deemed to be important enough. I thought this was a reference to Tripp's experience in the Radicombs. Oh, was it? I thought he was like needling to Paul a little bit about like the shit that he saw down there. 
<laughs> I think more horrifying than anything is the idea that Archer at this point could be known as an esteemed captain. Mm, yeah. I don't think we're there yet. Seems a little premature. I mean, he is the captain of the flagship, but for what reason? We know not. We'll get there eventually. Reed picks up a planet on sensors, Ben. Yeah. And it's alone and dark. It's a real dark boy. And uh, it is so interesting to the captain that he goes and takes a good look at it on the view screen, accidentally posing perfectly mm. for Trip to take a picture. That's great. You, you often get the best stuff when you're not really trying that hard, huh? Yeah. He's looking heroically off into the distance, and that's just what you want. I loved how this rogue planet looked. Yeah. So dark, so menacing. Really is. The idea of threat is apparent immediately. Yeah, it's great looking and it's, yeah, we get the little e explanation of what mean rogue planet. It's been knocked out of its orbit or something. Uh, but unlike what that would imply, it is not a frozen ball of dust. There's a bunch of volcanic activity that vents stuff into the atmosphere that keeps the planet warm, and therefore there is plant and animal life thriving down there. They gloss over the science of this very quickly, and that's because this isn't the story this episode is trying to tell. Yeah. But my mind couldn't help but put all this together. Like the idea of a rogue planet sustaining life just needs its own heat source yeah. and an atmosphere. And that's it. <laughs> like you don't depend on the gravity of a star in any way <sighs> when its own internal gravity is, is sufficient to keep things on its surface. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know they have science advisors on shows like this, mm -hmm. but they also have to overrule science advisors for stories sometimes. And I don't know. I have no idea if this is plausible. I mean, I love the idea. Yeah, there's theories that like some of the moons in our own solar system might be like hard outer shell of ice, inner ocean with life in it. Mm. And the thing that keeps that life alive is like the heat from the core of the planet or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went to like the European Space Agency on a video shoot that was also a huge challenge to make interesting interview backdrops for where they showed us like their plans for a probe that they're going to try and send to one of those moons that will like melt a hole in the ice and drop a submersible probe into the like subterranean ocean mm -hmm. and go like look for space whales or something. <laughs> So, uh, you know, maybe this is real. Maybe this is a, a thing. You can't keep your alien life dunked in water in the danger zone. <laughs> You're going to kill somebody. <laughs> we got you a sous vide <laughs> so, so that you can serve your customers beautiful fall off the bone meat every single time. What we've done for you is set up a sous vide station at each POS location of your restaurant. <laughs> Our thanks to our supplier, L.A. Sous Vide Machines Incorporated, <laughs> whose stickers are not removable. No. <laughs> so they, they also pick up a power signature down there. So there's like somebody has landed a ship on the surface of this planet, and they're like, oh, let's give them a call, see what they're up to. No answer. Away team goes down to say hi, despite how foreboding this seems like it would be. Is it foreboding or is it pretty par for the course when a Captain Archer hails you and you don't respond? <laughs> you think the, the word is out in the Alpha Quadrant? This fucking dope is flying around everywhere, blowing yeah. in calls to people. It's better just to ignore him. So in the shuttle pod descending toward the planet, we've got Archer, Reed, Hoshi, and T'Pol. And it's a pretty rough ride to the surface. It makes you expect danger where really none exists in this way. This is a technique the episode uses a lot, kind of mm. uh, faking you out with what the real danger might be. And so they're landing near the energy reading that they picked up before because that's where they think this ship is. And they make their way through the jungle towards what they believe is the ship on their sensors. They're talking along the way about various levels of skill, W slash R slash T, roughing it. And we learned that both 
Archer and Reed were Eagle Scouts. You are such a Boy Scout. When it's time to compare how many merit badges each of them earned, Reed only pulls out enough to win. Yeah, it's interesting that the one badge neither of them was able to get was kissing a girl. (laughs) So they got that in common. (laughs) Actually, I already have that one. I like those little night vision headsets they got there. Interesting that they're monocles, right? Yeah. And they look very Borgy in terms of their greenish hue. They do. They find like a bioluminescent centipede, which is like, I was like, this is like the one animal you don't need night vision for. <laughs> Why were they using that? <laughs> now there, there you go with your centipede merit badge. And you knew, <laughs> you knew that immediately. Yeah, I got it. Hey, there's a campsite here that seems to be abandoned, so they all push Triangle to pick up uh, gold coins and herbs and ammunition from around the place. Yeah. Archer calls out an in-person hail here. This is what I thought was funny. We're from the Starship Enterprise. Is there anyone here? Still, no one answers. The hey, you guys of hails. Yeah. Nobody's around, so T'Pol and Reed are going to go check out uh, the ship, which is not too far away. We never got to see their, the alien vessel, which I really wanted to. God, it would have been easy. It was so fucking dark on this set. Like, they just did the Sears Garden Center, but with no light. And This infuriated me so much. Yeah. Because you don't get a sense from just being around this alien species how advanced they are. I mean, they've got weapons sufficient for their hunt, but only a ship can tell you if they're advanced or behind of where the Enterprise is at, right? Yeah, it would have been so interesting to see. I mean, I'm just going to ask you, do you think these people are more advanced than than what we've got on the ship or and their technology? We don't have much to go on, but this is kind of the moment where the thing that made me feel they were more advanced happened, which is we see... We have wraparound goggles, and you just have this one monocle goggle. Well, wraparound goggles that are also like notably less grainy than the than the green mm-hmm. night vision that the Enterprise crew are using. It's like it's like crisp and clear. So you're saying only through uh, seeing through the eyes of a stranger are you actually able to understand how they see the world? I never really thought of it that way, but that's super deep. Yeah. Walk a mile in another man's night vision goggles. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So these guys look real tough, and they are uh, heavily armed with long guns. I think more than looking tough, don't they sound tough? They do. The voices on these actors. Yeah. We've never seen other humanoids here before. They didn't go super far with casting three different guys that look really different. Like, these guys... We learned their names, and I was like, I, they they don't seem to have any different job responsibilities. They are completely interchangeable, as far as I can tell, for the rest of the episode. They are all your dad's friend, and you aren't really <laughs> sure if they're from work or from some hobby or whatever, and you aren't even sure if they're different people. Yeah. They just come over sometimes. Yeah. And then they go out on the back deck and like kind of drink a lot, like more than you've ever seen your dad drink before. <laughs> and you know, the next morning, like, uh, not really to talk to your dad much, to like yeah. give him a wide berth. Make sure there aren't any Legos on the floor <laughs> anywhere dad might be walking tomorrow morning. <laughs> so yeah, we we start to meet these guys. Like they they capture Reed and Paul, but then when, when they bring them as prisoners back to camp, Archer and Hoshi have met the other one who... You know, Hoshi has like got the universal translator up and running so they can start to have a conversation. And we learn that this planet is called Dakala. Dakala? <laughs> Dakala? <laughs> it's like a, a popular snowboarding brand, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting the tone of the two interactions. Like, a couple of the Enterprise crew meet the hunters and it's kind of dicey, but the ones who remained in camp, it's extremely cool and chill. Yeah, 
They don't seem to be like worried about the fact that a lot of gold pieces are, have gone missing since the last time they were at their camp. Has somebody been hitting triangle around here? What's going on? <laughs> I I see uh, uh, there's been a ton of stringy bird meat <laughs> made up into these little bundles. Why are all these chests open forever <laughs> now? Archer asks if they can stay and hang out at the campsite. And yet another example of Archer kind of not reading the room. I mean, these guys are clearly on a boy's trip. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just out doing their hunt. And I think the last thing a tight-knit group of friends wants to have is a bunch of interlopers. On like a work trip, you know? Yeah. We could find another landing site, but I was hoping you might enjoy the company. These guys are too polite to kick them out of camp. So uh, they share a meal of dragon meat. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is fantastic by many estimates. The uh, Enterprise crew is highly complimentary of the hunter's uh, cooking skills. Archer's like, I should bring this up to the ship for uh, our great chef <laughs> to design meal ideas from. Yeah. You should probably know it is the main thing about my ship. <laughs> it's great chef <laughs> this is not one of those Star Trek ships that's full of the best and the brightest except for this one position we actually do have the best and the brightest but yeah they're, they talk about the what these guys are here for and this is where we learn that they are here to do a hunt and the humans are kind of like oh, we're not judging it's just not really something that's done where we're from anymore and the hunters are like, oh, yeah, but we don't hunt like the smart animals. Like there's primates that live here and we, we leave them alone. We just hunt these dragons because they taste so good. And they're dumb as hell. And <laughs> dumb tastes good. Real good. <laughs> dumb just falls off the bone. Reed is so in. Like after tasting this dragon meat, it's probably like marinated in pineapple, if I had to guess. You know, it kind of gives a new definition to low and slow when you're talking about a Drajan, right? Yeah. Low as in the temperature, slow as in the intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's real, it's, it's idiot meat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Reed is so so fucking excited to uh, to get to know these guys. He's like, I want to I want to join your hunt. Like, yeah, I stand what you guys are doing here. Uh, I'm super impressed with your like ninja skills because you snuck right up on us, and I've never seen anybody do that on me, Malcolm Reed, super soldier. You know, if you put a pineapple on this dragon meat, uh, what you'd have is like, hooli hooli, dumb dragon. <laughs> <laughs> see if our chef can whip up that recipe I'll pass dork god that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> so Trip and Reed go uh, up to the ship to get more camping supplies because they're going to be staying down here like they don't ever use the, the shuttle like an RV it seems like they want like tents and stuff how interested do you think Reed is in roughing it at this point in his life, given Shuttle Pod 1 <laughs> was just an experience of his? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's why he doesn't want to stay in the Shuttle Pod. Maybe, uh, maybe a tent is preferable in that context. God, I would be Shuttle Pod camping. No question. Get me off of the ground. Hoshi is all the way out in sort of the inverse of Reed's level of enthusiasm for what's going on down on the planet. She's like, you know, miss me with the little critter that lays eggs in your ear. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to sleep up here. And uh, that's pretty persuasive, right? Sure is. Yeah. So on the surface, T'Pol and Archer work out a plan for future visitors from Enterprise. This is going to be a project for them. Because Rogue Planet is really interesting. Remember? Yeah. Rogue Planet being the most interesting part of this episode? We're going to bring down scientists. They're going to study all of the interesting life forms and volcanic activity on this planet. 
And they are just sitting around the campfire, totally unconcerned about the possibility that something could crawl into their ear and lay eggs at any moment. It's weird that in this moment, one of the Eska, and we can't emphasize this enough, a person whose name we've heard and immediately forgot because he looks just (laughs) like every other one, is like, yeah, you might as well hit the hay because uh, hunting day is coming up and you're going to need your strength. So why don't you lay down? on the ground with your ears in close proximity (laughs) to the vegetation. There you saw day long. Archer later is like following this advice and is maybe awakened or maybe just like startled out of a referee by what sounds like his name being said, but might just be the insect eggs rubbing against each other inside his ear canal. But he's definitely like, feels like he's hearing something. Yeah. And he starts wandering off into the forest and there is a lady in a sheer nightgown in that forest. Classic ghost shit, right? Yeah. I mean, we've seen this ghost in an episode of Baywatch when we were recording our hit episode Santa Monica Mountains podcast. She's straight out of there. She really is. Although the wig is a lot better on this ghost. (laughs) Yeah. Fair to say that this ghost lady is very comely and uh, she's very flighty. Yeah. She runs away from Archer and the weird part about her running away from Archer is that Archer does not run after her or call to her or anything. He basically turns around to camera. Yeah. Doesn't even tell her his address or social security number. So back at camp, the group discusses what happened. And no one can really explain what it might have been. I mean, there's no other ships around. There's no other hunting party there. And a search party was sent out into the jungle, and they have returned and found nothing. So... This seems like a good opportunity for Archer to continue, if not double down, his description of what he saw, (laughs) even though the more he talks, the more he sounds like a lunatic. She was wearing some kind of a nightgown. A nightgown, sir. So Paul's like, oh, maybe you dreamt it. And And the main dude is like, this was probably something that happened inside your head. And Archer's like, no, this was real. I think we've talked a lot about over the years, the moments where captains have admitted being compromised and that being like a really good thing to admit something's up with you and maybe it's not a good idea for you to be captain anymore. Totally. Archer does not subscribe yet to that belief because if, (laughs) if I'm Archer, I wouldn't say shit. (laughs) I wouldn't say it before, during, or after this. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it under your uh, hat for a little while. See if it happens again, you know? Yeah. Or if it was just a fluke. Three times is a trend. Maybe go up to the ship and have Phlox put an otoscope in your ear. See what's up with the eggs. If those could be scooped out or something like that. One comely nightgown lady is none. Uh, Two is one. (laughs) Three is a trend. Yeah. Three is like maybe the insects are now burrowing past your ear canal and into your brain. Yeah. Uh, This has the effect of rendering the victim extremely susceptible to uh, suggestion. So they're prepping for a hunt. And these guys talk about how they've got two days left for their hunt uh, because their custom is that you can only go to this planet for four days a year. That's how long hunting season is on the Rouge planet. So they're pretty eager to get going and Reed tags along with them while Archer and the rest of the crew go check out lava vents. We finally see what these little pig beasts look like. And they look like little floppy puppets from the Dark Crystal. (laughs) I couldn't get that image out of my mind. Look at these little dumb pigs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Tasting so good like that with your yeah. dumb ass. Yeah. We see one of them like lose a game of tic-tac-toe to itself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you say, 
T'Pol and Trip Tucker and Archer are in some other place exploring some steam vents, and there's a pretty good chance Archer has never seen slits this hot and moist before. <laughs> he compares it to uh, to Yellowstone, and I loved when T'Pol was like, no, it's like Denver Prime. And <laughs> <laughs> Archer and Jim were like, nobody knows what that is, T'Pol. <laughs> that's a ball kick that's just for T'Pol to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. It misses Archer, but uh, it still gets her what she needs. Yeah. I mean, like, that's almost more satisfying sometimes, right? Like, the ball kick that the person didn't even realize was a ball kick. T'Pol goes off and relishes in her phantom ball kick, leaving <laughs> Trip and Archer to talk about Nightgown Girl again. Absolutely wild how this scene unfolds because Trip is like, I don't know, man. And the captain is like, I've never done a foolish thing in my life. Name one. <laughs> That's something that someone says only as dialogue and never in real life. Like yeah. you and I have known each other for a long time. We've been, we've been friends a very long time. If I tried to challenge you to say a foolish thing I'd, I'd done, I wouldn't like the answer. You would <laughs> I would start a new podcast and make that the topic. <laughs> And let me tell you, we'd never run out of episodes. <laughs> and then you'd do one about me, and it would be half as long, but still very long. Mm. <laughs> the point is, don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. That's it exactly. It's a, another bad look for Archer here. Yeah. Right now, in this moment, Archer, you're doing a foolish thing yeah. that would be an example of the thing you're claiming you never do. It's interesting that Archer, again tries to describe the thing that he saw, but unlike before, he also defends his reason for bringing it up, which helps even less, I think. The idea that he was like not in control of his own actions is really troubling, and I thought it was strange that this was when he brought that up for the first time, because it seemed like in the group with people who know more about this planet than you is the time to be like, I had like a scary experience where I wasn't mm -hmm. entirely in control of my own faculties. Anybody know what's up with that? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, we cut back to the hunt and one of them thinks that he sees what he refers to as a wraith, but then it's kind of explained away as steam from a lava vent. And Reed is like, Ooh, steam from a lava vent. Let me go scan it. And they're like, no, 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 don't scan the steam. I mean, the Eska in the scene take conspicuous care to make sure Reed is kept separate from this wraith, the whole wraith situation. They're like, yeah, go fuck off over there. We got to keep you safe from this thing. And that means that Reed has not gotten a look at this at all. Yeah. Trip is back taking pictures at uh, the lava vents, which distracts him enough for Archer to find this lady again and wander off into the forest without giving Trip a zup. Hey, I'm going to go talk to this chick. <laughs> you really shouldn't go wandering off in a jungle of a rogue planet anyway, right? Yeah. Cherche la femme all you want, but not in the dark in a jungle when you don't tell anybody where you're going, you know? He finds this lady again and she says his name and that makes him unzip his uniform mm. to get a universal translator out. And when he took this device out, I thought about how much of a better idea it would be for him to take out a communicator to corroborate his batshit crazy story. <laughs> right? Yeah. Is this because he's in her thrall and he doesn't have control over what he's doing? Do you think that is a power that these wraiths have? I thought it was purely observational. I didn't think it was mind controlly. Yeah, I mean, we only get that one reference where he says, like, I don't do foolish things. And this, you know, I was, I was clearly doing a foolish thing here. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. But, um, yeah, I was just mainly distracted in this scene by this not being Garcelle Beauvais from the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Hmm. It's just a completely different person. This person is not Haitian American at all. Not one bit. And I don't watch that program, and even I know that. Yeah. Faith of the fart. And you will never take the greatest chin alive. Ben would rather die. Rather 
She claims that she needs him and that he's different than the others. So it seems like whatever force behind it has singled Archer out as uh, in a unique position uh, to help in whatever way they need help. Using seduction language primarily. Yeah. Because when you tell a stranger that you're not like any of the others, the implication there is clear. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of happening concurrently with the hunters heating up their guns and starting to shoot at something off in the distance. And the geography of this was a little confusing. I was like worried that what was about to happen was the hunters were going to like jump into this clearing and that was what she was freaked out about. But I think it was just she was freaked out because the hunters were shooting stuff and that's what her problem is. Is that your read on this? She was presenting some, like, spooked deer vibes, you know? Yeah. She was ready to get the hell out of there. And, I mean, it's not just the hearing of the hunt nearby. It's Tripp and T'Pol arriving with flashlights that that make her finally go. Yeah. And they're like, hey, Archer, what are you doing out here? And Archer does not tell them what he was doing out there, which is very suspicious. I was just taking a piss. Yeah. I don't do foolish things. What are you talking about? Where's the piss, Archer? Show me the piss. <laughs> I was around here somewhere. If he had to take a piss, would he have to unzip from his neck all the way down? Oh, man. That is a good question. I never thought about that. Yeah, kind of a production. I mean, but that's like a question with all Star Trek uniforms in a way. Like, are you telling me that there's no opening on the fly on a back zip? Action jacket lets you piss. Action jacket lets you piss. Mm -hmm. Man. I mean, that's straight out of the commercial, though. And its famous tagline, action jacket lets you piss. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, this coincides with a wraith attacking a hunter. And we see this from a POV of this, like, sluggy alien slapping into his field of view. And then uh, back at the camp... One of the three hunters is gravely wounded. He has a, uh, a bloody chest wound. Uh, we learn that he's lost a lot of blood. And the Enterprise crew are able to persuade these guys that uh, a shuttle evac is probably the best call. And part of this is just their urgency around finishing their hunt in the time they have allotted. You probably know this reference off the top of your head, but like... Isn't it always more upsetting when you're playing a video game and you're you're fighting monsters or, or whatever for that monster to be like sluggy and slappy <laughs> instead of one with appendages and and things to throw at you? Like I feel like the kind that just sort of flips <laughs> at you and the and the accompanying sound is just ugh the worst. Yeah, and it's something that like they've been able to do in computer animation for a long time. Yeah. In a way that this this like I thought that the CG in this episode held up really good. Yeah, not bad. So this injured Eska, it feels like they could treat him in the field hospital camp area, like and he'd probably be fine, but Archer's like, "Look, we get a Dr. Flox up there. I mean, I've told you about the chef." Yeah. He, the chef's great. I need to reiterate how great our chef is. Our doctor, not quite as great of a doctor as our chef is a chef, but still very good. So why don't we bring this guy up to the ship? This guy's got slugs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you'll love these slugs. They send him up. Like, Archer doesn't want to leave the camp, but the hunters are kind of like, hey, we kind of want to focus on the hunt with the time we have left. These hunters just don't act in a familiar way at all. Like, if I'm... In a place with a camp, I'm not going to let some fucking stranger chill out there while I go hunting. It's just too suspicious. And the guy who wants to stay there is the one who's been seeing shit that that isn't there. Yeah. I don't know. So Paul is the one that Archer approaches with his confession about, let's call her ear egg lady for lack of a better term, probably something Mm. to do with the ear eggs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
this is met with uh, slightly more openness by T'Pol because she is able to determine that he wasn't hallucinating or dreaming based on like tricorder readings, I guess. But uh, he won't see a doctor. He won't like go up and tell Flocks about what's going on in a way that I feel like almost approaches a moment where T'Pol should have been like, okay, I've got to relieve you of command because clearly like something is going on right now. Funny how that never feels on the table. Ever. It doesn't. Yeah. What Archer tells her is that he's not going to go back to the ship, even though he's acting like this and seeing all this weird stuff in the jungle. And really what he wants to do more than anything is go back into the jungle and confirm what he's been seeing. And it's really important that he goes alone. Yeah. And that's the worst sounding part of this. It's a real buddy system skeptic. Yeah. I love to Paul going like, if it was like a partially nude man would you be so excited about going back into the jungle archer's like this is early 2000s tv so (laughs) 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 up on the ship trip pays a visit to six bay where phlox is uh putting the finishing touches on healing up one of them which one? Who's to say? <laughs> we we see the chart that Dr. Flox is holding and the name line is blank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he found some cellular residue in the wound, which he says is like mutating and doing weird stuff. A subject of concern, uh, but we cut right back down to the planet where Archer is having a conversation with his mystery ghost ear egg lady. This lady grabs him this time, and it is startling that he can feel her touch. Yeah. And she admits once again that uh, Archer is just not like the others. Yeah. And that her people are not like him. She starts, you know, like getting into some of her favorite parts of They Not Like Us and feels really inappropriate at this moment, but it's also just such a banger. It's like, you know. Let's give it a listen. Yeah. She can become anything, she says. And it becomes clear that this is what the hunters are hunting. If I'm Archer, this has got to come with a demonstration. Oh, you can become anything, can you? <laughs> You're just going to tell me you can? How about become a nakeder lady? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see that nighty become a little more sheer. <laughs> Does it work like a slider where we can just kind of like fade it up and down? Or <laughs> Have you ever seen Weird Science? I'm going to start feeding you prompts from this magazine that I brought with me to the campsite. <laughs> like we're sick to manage it. You'd love it. Back at the camp, the hunters are reunited and they're having a toast to flocks. Archer toasts to their hunt, but now is acting a little bit suspicious about these guys and the fact that they haven't been totally candid about what they are there to hunt. And they start talking about, oh yeah, like we're actually hunting something that can get inside your mind, not just inside of your ear, like the insects that lay the eggs, but fully inside your mind. This explains the Eska's weird desire to grab one of these uh, dumb pigs and uh, dump it in the middle of Central Park. (laughs) <laughs> as some sort of weird prank. <laughs> Interesting how the Eska agree all at once to sort of drop the charade and start admitting what they're there to actually hunt and how dangerous this prey actually is. This is a prey that can get inside your mind. And that's what Archer's been seeing. He has a very dark story about one of them attacking his father and the folks in his father's hunting party. And his father survived, thank God. A great Mm. man his father was. But most of this hunting party was killed. Do you think they can read your mind just because those eggs are like right there? (laughs) Probably. (laughs) I can do A story like this has to have the father die because it right. gives this character a reason to be on this sort of bloodlust they clearly have. I think it takes the lust and the blood out of his reason for hunting by having him survive, right? Right. Like, 
you think about your dad's friend who came over and they sat on the back porch and drank all that beer. Now, if your dad went hunting with that friend and that friend was claimed by a mysterious wraith that <laughs> uh, that tricked them into a into a box canyon uh-huh. and only your father and a couple of others got away, you wouldn't be like, I've got to get revenge for my dad's weird friend that came over. <laughs> exactly how you've described... <laughs> This story and this person's reason for being so enthusiastic for the hunt just doesn't quite hang together for me. And so I was expecting for another shoe to drop after this. Clearly, this wasn't a reason sufficient for the hunt and this person's single-mindedness toward hunting these things into extinction, right? I mean, there's there's also like an argument over their intelligence mm-hmm. and the hunter guys are like, oh yeah, like, I mean... Obviously, intelligence is like somewhat subjective, but like we, none of us would consider them to be intelligent. I mean, they're dumb, but they're not like those fucking dumb fuck pigs that we <laughs> eat all the time. Just the, the slowest of the slow. You know, and and now that I think about it, they taste less good. So maybe it's like a an inverse correlation. Like the dumber you get, the tastier you get. Mm. Is that possible? Probably. But they also say, like, we develop technology where we can detect the the pheromones that this creature emits when it's afraid, and that gives us an advantage in these hunts. So uh, we would like to get on with hunting one of them before our window closes because, uh, like we said, we only have those two days left. The whole goggles to see pheromones thing at this point was like, <laughs> come on. Did you guys order this out of the back of a porno magazine or something? (laughs) Yeah. So that's what the hunters do is they corner these wraiths. They start emitting this chemical. And then uh, when they're able to pick this up on their red goggles, they shoot. Yeah. That's how they get them. So up on the ship, we have a McLaughlin group. Issue one. About how distasteful they all find this to be. Yeah. And to Paul's like, yeah, but like, you know, we don't have any like jurisdiction here. It's not, it's not our place to stop them or or correct them or do anything. And even if we stop these guys, it's not like these people are not going to keep coming here and doing this. Archer's like, what can I say? These wraiths are hot, and they need me to save them. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do. Yeah. And how we're gonna do it is pretty passively. We're gonna come up with a chemical agent that masks the other chemical agent that is released by these wraiths. It's going to scramble their their little red goggles so much that they won't be able to hunt them as effectively. And it's going to give these beautiful blonde women a chance to survive. These super fuckable wraiths. I'll start right away. Later in the mess hall, uh, Trip is up late and uh, the only thing that can satisfy his thirst is a giant glass of milk and a Coke float glass. And uh, it's in this scene that Archer bores him with his retelling of a Yeats poem. And in this piece, there's the description of a woman. With apple blossoms in her hair. And this woman is the woman he saw on the rogue planet. Yeah. And this is a reason that Archer sort of remembers and sort of does not remember this person. Because as a young man, you jack it to all sorts of materials. Yeats poetry. Yeah. That's like the most Star Trek jack off material there probably has yeah. ever been right yeah that's the four piece string concerto in 10 forward of jack off materials you remember how john rambo in rambo first blood part two was shown all of the uh weapons and technology available to him to complete his mission and his whole deal was i always thought the mind was the best weapon Hmm. This scene sort of postulates that Archer always believed that the mind was the best pornography. (laughs) Some people. I like that. So he gets summoned by Flocks on the radio, and we cut down to the planet where the hunters are on to a wraith and uh, trying to corner it. And it appears to be a Drajan, and... It's just going like, but then it turns into a tree and it suddenly seems way smarter. (laughs) Yeah. The, the wisdom of the tree apparent here. (laughs) 
So wise. The relative wisdom of the tree. Like, I'm smarter than that tree, but like... You don't see people wanting to eat any trees, though. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, they can't detect it. They're like scanning around, and it bonks one of them, and now the hunters are all freaking out. They get back to camp, and Archer is there to kind of gloat about they were able to do something to teach the wraiths to suppress this pheromone, I guess. But it's interesting how unspoken what happened is, right? Like the returning hunting party is like, God, our red goggles are ineffective. And Archer's like, huh, interesting. Well, anyway, I guess we're going to leave you to it. And that's about as close as he gets to admitting fault for that. And as about as close as we get to understanding what he did. Like, did he give them technology? Did he give them, like, bug repellent that they could spray on themselves to mask this odor? Like, Did they shoot a thing from orbit? Yeah. I don't know. What was it? We don't know. Feels like we skipped a scene here. The hunters are pretty cheesed off about this whole thing, but Archer walks into the forest to uh, have one last little interlude with shift-dressed ghost ear eggs lady <laughs> mm. just rolls off the tongue yep. <laughs> when you say it that way <laughs> she seems insistent that he not forget about her and that there is some sort of thing between them that mm-hmm. I think conversely she will never forget and then she takes his hand and then she lets it go like at the end of all romance movies you know where the love doesn't last you mm-hmm. do that very dramatic like let go of the fingertips finally mm-hmm. before they're gone. Who who doesn't love that moment? A couple seconds pass and Archer's, you know, feeling the feels of a love that he's got to let go. And then she transforms into a terrifying slug. <laughs> 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 when this thing slithers into the forest, they cut back to Archer and his face here, Bill Tilly. You got to put this expression on the card. Mm -hmm. What is this face? It looks like he's gagging. Yeah. As the saying goes, he does not look happy to watch her go or leave or whatever. I heard that the special costume effects team was really annoyed with Alan Croker, the director of this episode, because he didn't get any coverage of Archer, like, from the knees up and... They had rigged this whole thing where it would look like his boner immediately disappeared when yeah. she turned into the slug. Yeah. Like there there was like an inflatable mechanism in the pants that would just give way. <laughs> boner would completely die down. And uh and it's like not in the episode. It's like, why did we even spend the time rigging that up? Is Slug Lady attractive to those who prefer tentacle porn? Oh. Because maybe the expression on Archer's face is Oh, could you imagine what that thing could have done to my crank? <laughs> All wrapped around it like like 14 washcloths. I feel like the tentacle porn community are kind of focused on what the tentacles are doing to ladies rather than what the tentacles are doing to gentlemen. Well, I don't like that. <laughs> You're an equal opportunity tentacle man. I sure am. <laughs> ben, did you like this episode? Yeah, I mean, I think that this episode was a bit mid in its premise and a bit poor in its execution. Like, I can tell that this is the kind of episode that a producer just fucking loves because, mm. oh, we just cast, like, we're, we got, like, one casting call for three for three different characters, right? Because they're all the same type. So we just bring in all of the actors that fit this general description tap three of them on the shoulder. We're shooting the whole thing in a Sears garden center at night, so we don't have to build any sets. We don't have to do anything. Like, we're never even going to see another alien spaceship in this. Like, the most expensive thing about this episode is probably animating Drajans walking around. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. And even then, these dumb fucks don't deserve that (laughs) big of a portion of the budget, right? (laughs) I'm honestly wondering, did a Drajan write this script? Because it seemed like it kind of sucked. Oh! 
you just got banned. <laughs> Ben's gonna hang up on this episode. Fucking spiciest takes in the game coming from me lately. Wow. Wow. How about you? I know there have been times I've watched episodes like this where my review has been like, this sucks. They (laughs) ran out of money and they did a stupid story. (laughs) I don't know what's changed about me, but I like this dumb little story. Okay. (laughs) I like a really nice low stakes weird rogue planet full of hunters hunting slug ladies like we're never gonna hear from this rogue planet again or Mm -hmm. these eska or these slug folks the stakes seem extremely low at all times the only people who get hurt or are the eska and even the eska we don't really give a shit about yeah there's something so nice about like a low stakes episode of star trek that is just dumb star trek fun This is dumb Star Trek, and I mean that with affection. Yeah. Yeah, good call. That's where I'm at with it. Let's uh, see what sort of dumb we find in the Priority One message inbox, (laughs) Ben. Let's do it. We really supply the dumb, and FODs supply the messages for us to read. Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Need a supplemental income. Supplemental income? Supplemental. Supplemental. Yeah, it's extra. The interest alone could be enough to buy this ship. Adam, our first P1 here is of a promotional nature, and it goes like this. Everyone knows that Mornhammered episodes are the best. This was almost a Mornhammered episode, right? Didn't you roll? It would have been. We were on square 100. Almost could have been one. Yep. What synergy that that would have been if, uh, if we'd hit it. But what my theory presupposes is maybe they could be better. Here's how. Cue this old enterprise. Now, when you're going to do a Mon Hammond, what you got to do is cross it with a live video stream and a chat room. Then all your FODs can enjoy the benefits together. Incidentally, was horrified to hear Adam say that not all shots are 1.5 ounces, but you do you. Shouldn't be encouraging too much excessive drinking. Cue new hyper compliance drop. Ben's hyper compliance. Am I the only one around here gives a shit about the rule? Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. If the rule you followed brought you to this, of what use was the rule? Compliance. Mm, yeah. yeah. Don't thank me or anything. So, so the call to action here is: more and hammered episodes should be live on video with chat room, and that's from Gray Man. I don't hate that idea. I think it would take some doing to put it on the Twitch or whatever. Yeah, but we figured that out before. Yeah. And I think that would be easier now with our the way we do our video conferences. So, yeah, we could we could potentially look into that. Like I I wouldn't want to be interacting with the chat during because I feel like It would like make a 3-hour episode if we did. Yeah. And and unlistenable for the home podcast listener, but Fair. Gray man, your your pitch is going to be taken under advisement, which is more than we can say for anyone that merely gets a personal priority one message. Uh, regarding the 1.5 ouncer shot, uh, Ben and I are in agreement that uh, the the home pour is a two ounce pour. But for the purposes of a Mornhammered episode where it's like a power hour situation, 1.5 ounce pours of beer are what you want to do. If you're yeah. getting a little loose with it, you're going to get a little more or a little less there, but. Yeah, generally, uh, with the beer, I'm with you on 1.5, and for everything else, the two. Yeah. Ben, we've got another priority one message here. This one is from Corey with Annie and Emmett as official witnesses, and it oh, is to man. This, Becca. This has been, like, uh, notarized, this priority one message? This message goes like this. I made a bet with you after watching season one, episode seven of Star Trek Enterprise that Adam and Ben would do a parodic riff in the style of R.E.M.'s Stand for Shran. <laughs> that did not happen. Wow. This is my payment for said bet. And maybe I'll get you a pre and or post Cabanica Coco No-No at Golden Tiki this year at STLV. Wow. Also, I love you and stuff. Thanks for being the best living human. That rules. Um, <laughs> I mean, it does kind of write itself, right? 
Shran is an Andorian. He's so conniving. <laughs> Close. I think I think we almost have our arms around that one. Yeah, I mean, that's without thinking about it at all. You and I went to Golden Tiki at STLV. Uh, what a place. It was a delight. It was lots of fun. I'm still mad at myself for smashing my tiki mug that I got there, uh, like, moments after we got to the Rio Hotel. Ben, I love you so much. <laughs> no, you don't. But the moment... Don't bullshit a bullshitter. When we were on the car ride back from Golden Tiki to the hotel properties, and I was like, you should take that back to the room. Let's not take that out into the world to the masquerade bar. It's, it's too dangerous. You were so confident. Yeah. I worried so much for that glass. Well. And when its bag of shards was handed to me, I, I didn't have the heart to give them to you. I was like, you should, <laughs> you should dispose of this, friendly bartender. <laughs> Don't have the heart to do it. <laughs> I did abandon the shards on that bar, didn't I? You left the shards. Yeah. Fuck. Amazing. Shards on the bar in the Rio. They're still there because no one cleans the Rio because the Rio's a shitty hotel. The Rio doesn't clean the carpets, they just replace the carpet. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like Adam on tour with underwear. Mm, indeed. Uh, our last pew on here is from Lee Moore of Sheffield, UK. It's to Ben and Adam. It goes like this. B&A! My wife, Roz, passed away on January 24th after a fight with cancer. And while she was never an FOD, we did like watching Trek together. I shared GG jokes, which she liked, and they'd end up in our personal bit stores. Listening to the pod helped me fill a quiet house with surprisingly comforting dick jokes. Thank you. Looking forward to the London show. Oh, boy, Lee. I'm uh, really sorry to hear that and really glad to hear that we could give you any sort of comfort during what has got to be a tough time. Yeah, man. I'm hoping you'll come up and introduce yourself after the London show because uh, that's a super tough thing you went through and uh, anything that we could do to make that slightly less horrific is uh, something I'm glad we could do, even though we weren't really trying. We'll fill your house with dick and fart jokes. <laughs> you know that's what we're going to do. We'll send you home with a bag full of shards of dick and fart jokes. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to get a Priority One message, head to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron and set one up today. Hey, Ben. What's that, Adam? Did you find yourself a drunk Shimoda this episode? Incredible. Drunk Shimoda. Hmm. I think I'm going to have to give it to, I don't know which of them, but all three, I guess, of the mm. other guys. I feel like what's funny about them to me is how quickly they clocked the Enterprise crew as people that were going to be really judgmental of their hobby. And so kind of slow rolled what they were actually up to. And it's not like a funny laugh out loud moment, but the more I think about it in retrospect, the funnier it is. They were like, these guys are pretty square. We better kind of <laughs> obfuscate what exactly it is that we are hunting. Like, obviously, we'll give them some Drajan meat, and they'll be like, oh, these guys are cool, but uh, if they know any more, it's going to go bad for us. I couldn't get over the voices of these aliens, these Eska, mm. and primarily that of uh, the one played by Keith Zarabajka. They killed more of us than we did of them. It's so gravelly. Yeah. He's got, like, a voice that could do uh, film trailers. <laughs> <laughs> and when I looked at his IMDb, he is a, a video game voice legend, I think, wow. for a reason. Just so many video game voice credits here. Not a surprise at all. That rules. Yeah, a lot of animation. Guy's got gravel-filled golden pipes. <laughs> so uh, just, just a drunk Shimoda from me to him for his noteworthy performance. Absolutely. Face of the fart. Why don't you tell us what we're watching on the next episode and uh, go over to gox.biz slash game to see how we're going to watch it. Next episode is season one, episode 19, Acquisition. When the Ferengi, a group of intergalactic thieves, stun the Enterprise crew and try to rob the ship, it's up to Trip to work covertly to stop them. Finally. How early is 
too early to introduce the Ferengi <laughs> to a Star Trek series. What Star Trek Enterprise presupposes is the 19th episode of the first season. Yeah. Intergalactic thieves is kind of an interesting way of putting it. Mm -hmm. what, what other galaxies are they going to to, to thieve around in? I don't know. Uh, anyways. I do not know. I am at the Game of Buttholes, The Will of the Riker, Quantum Leap, where our runabout can quantum leap anywhere on the board. Uh, we are rolling from square 100, and I'm going to hit the button now. You're required to learn as you play. Roll. I have jumped us to square 38. Tula! Did I win? Hardly. Which is a regular square, regular episode next week. Got that. Every row has got multiple things on it. We have missed the last few times. Yeah. Giving us a false sense of safety, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking forward to it. I want a clear mind, a clear conscience when I'm reviewing what the Ferengi are up to. Yeah, agreed. I don't want a belly full of breadsticks for that one. <laughs> I want to focus on the task at hand. <laughs> uh, well, I want to focus on all of the gratitude we have for Friends of DeSoto who support what we do here on a monthly basis by going to MaximumFun.org slash join. Uh, we sure appreciate your assistance, and uh, we hope you appreciate the bonus episodes you get access to for doing that. Got to thank Wendy Pretty, our producer, who edits these shows and uh, keeps all of the plates spinning at Uxbridge Shimoda HQ. Got to thank Rob Adler and Bill Tilly who run our social media accounts. Follow at Greatest Trek all over social media. And uh, hey, check out our, our newsletter that uh, Rob Adler puts together every month. Sign up for that at gach.biz slash mail. You and I are writing pieces for that right now as we have uh, the last few months of the newsletter. It's a fun little creative outlet for you and me. Sure is. Really look forward to it. And of course, we got to thank Adam Ragusea for our parody theme music based on Diane Warren's original Enterprise theme and Dark Materia for the card song. With that, we will be back at you next week with another great episode of Star Trek Enterprise and an episode of The Greatest Generation Enterprise where we once again thank our lucky stars that the sharpen your own teeth square didn't make it onto the game of buttholes. Oof. My head's just ringing thinking about it. <laughs> uh, my head's ringing because of all these alien eggs that have been laid in my ears. Do you mind if I go uh, knock those out? You've told me that you're not a Q-tip man, so I don't know how you think you're going to get those out of there. Yeah, about one of those little uh, little cameras that get advertised on mm. Instagram. Mm. For clearing out earwax. Mm. Make it so. Make it so. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows. Supported directly by you.